Hey everybody, so we have another video today. We were going to do one yesterday, but got delayed. Uh, I want to talk about this project I have open. I did a little survey on the channel asking for what topics people were most interested in, and I was really surprised by a landslide. Songwriting was a thing that most people were interested in. Followed, I think, by like Logic Basics, and then Live Loops was extremely low. So we're going to do a little bit with songwriting today. I actually started this song on the channel a couple months ago, I think, where I did a live write-up or a live basically composing a lot of the basic tracks. So I'll link that video down in the description if you want to go back and see what that was like. But I want to talk about then how I actually finished the song uh, specifically looking at some of the vocal techniques and some of the panning and effects that I used. Because for me, songwriting is partially about figuring out the instruments I'm going to use. And it's partially about, you know, coming up with uh, the form of the song, although I pretty much use the same form that everybody uses. But for me, the heart of the song comes when I start actually doing lyrics and singing. And I'm in no way, shape, or form a great singer. In fact, that's one of the things I love about technology is that it has made it possible for me to actually do some of the things I'm thinking of without having necessarily like the, the years and years of training. Uh, it's more about the emotion for me and the story. And I like that the tools get me the rest of the way. Okay, so let me just play the very beginning of the song so you can hear what it sounds like. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the production things. And I'm going to lay this out really organized so you can actually see what we're going to be doing in just one second. Here's the beginning of the song. Okay, so let's just stop there. Uh, what I want to do, and if you want to hear the whole song, um, you can go to Apple Music. It's on Spotify. Here's my name, Sam McGuire, and it's the one I left behind. Really just released like a week ago. Um, so if you want to go check it out, uh, you can actually listen to it on any of the main streaming things. Okay, so um, what we have, and that's not a plug. I don't... I don't make any money from my music I put online. I don't want you to feel like I'm sending you there as an advertisement. It's really just if you're interested in hearing the full song. I, I could care less, actually, if you if you do go, um, because I literally make like one penny a year on any music I stream. That's not what I do for my living. This is more just me and my creative outlet. Um, and if someone said... Hey, we love your music. Do you want to do a full album and go on tour? I would say no, because I I actually have a career that I love very much, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay, so that being said, here we have the tracks, and I want to go through just some of the, the basic core elements that I used to create the song, the, the pieces that I felt like really made it something different for me. I tend to use the same pretty much the same everything when I'm doing songwriting. S similar drum kits, a similar keys, a similar bass. Uh, I don't usually get too creative with any of that stuff. In this case, I did change it up a little bit. So here's the keys that I used 
when I first, so I, um, you're seeing this in compositional order. Uh, I haven't reorganized it. I'm not giving this mix to someone else to mix. So uh, you're seeing it in the exact order that I made the song. So I came up with the keys first. And normally I would have just the keys. But I added the step effects to give it that pulsing rhythm on it. I love this driven pulse patch. So I really liked how that particular piece added to it, just that the, the pulsing rhythm there and how that changed it. Then we have the drums, which I added So pretty simple in terms of the verse. Well, it's one of the brush kits that we have. Uh, I think let's come over and look at the actual drummer. This is Tyrell Pop Brush with the Speakeasy kit. Uh, the chorus gets a little bit different. And then the only other real change happens at the bridge. And so then I added the bass because I figured out the harmony. And I started here with the verses. Sometimes I start with a chorus if it comes like a musical thought comes to me. But in this case, I did the verses and then I took everything in the verses and just really changed some of the progression and how the parts were laid out for the chorus. So it's maintained a similar feel and sound. So again, another really rhythmic part here to kind of offset what's happening with that original keys part, uh, but a similar part for sure. This rhythm is created inside Alchemy. Uh, I think, pretty sure I just picked a preset and didn't adjust anything. So sometimes I'm going into Alchemy and, and tweaking a bunch, and sometimes I'm just like, you know, give me something right off the bat that, that seems to work okay. Everything stays the same for those first four tracks, except during the bridge when I drop out Alchemy. And that's because with the bridge, you usually want to change something different. And I felt like instead of going bigger with the bridge, I wanted to actually pull it back just a little bit and make it kind of a break in some ways. Then the only other instrument we have is this dobro. And I've always been on the fence with this dobro part. I love the instrument, the dobro. It's a type of guitar. Um, and I always get negative feedback on every single time I do a dobro. But I don't know, something about it always speaks to me. And I think that that's just me being me. But here's the part there's it's repeated four different times and then the bridge has a slightly different one
You can see it actually, that was a glitch when I first did it. Uh, I didn't mean it to have that slow uh, crescendo as it goes through all the parts, but I noticed it at some point when I was already pretty happy with the song and thought, you know what, I've never noticed that it kind of gets a little bit louder as it goes, so I'm just going to leave it. Uh, one of those quirky things that if it doesn't make a huge difference, then then why mess with it? Okay, so that then takes us to the vocal part. And I use the notes, the notepad when I'm actually composing. And I have the microphone right in front of me with a screen. Um, and I just sing it. And then I sing and sing and sing. And I get parts I like, and then I start finalizing it. So some of these, you'll see a bunch of different takes in here. Uh, those are harmonies. Uh, let's see if I can show you as well. I do use uh, the, the different alternate tracks. So here was an original something or other. And then as I finalized it, I moved it into a different one. But I kept everything. So I keep everything, and that's how I prefer to work for this. But... I I mean, I'm not going to play this without the processing on it. That's definitely not something I'm interested in doing. But here's my signal chain. I have a pitch correction plug-in on there. Just the, the default logic one set to zero millisecond response. And in the key of the song. So that locks it all down. You get a little bit of uh, the T-Pain type effect with autotune. But for the most part, I try to make that minimal because I go through and actually edit a lot of this using flex pitch on top of that. So then I go through note by note and figure out what needs to be changed a little bit or what needs to stay the same. So we'll look at that in a second. After I get the first one, then I'm coming through and doing um, harmony. So I set up all my tracks. I've got one, two, three, and then a fourth one comes in of the harmony. So five total vocal tracks for that last outro section. Um, so here's the very first one. Was a story from my youth. Was a story that was truth. And I knew that it was here. And so you'll hear there's a little bit of mouth noise on this. And... I debated a long time, you know, changing that, making it cleaner. And it made me think a little bit, and I don't compare myself to Pink Floyd, but in the final cut, uh, in the Gunner's Dream, and there's another part too, uh, where he's talking about the glitter already, um, that you can hear some of the mouth noise. And it just reminded me so much of that. And it's reminded me that singers are singing and not just robots, that I totally just left it in there. So... Listen again, you'll hear it, but it's not something I'm going to take out or edit. I actually kind of like that there was a little bit of just complete humanness right there. Was a story from my youth, was a story that was truth, and I knew that it was here. I heard it once, it stayed for life, I knew that it would never be. I knew that this was going to be my knife In the end it haunted me And in the end I haunted you And in the time it took to figure out its truth And when it came around to me I knew that this was what was supposed to be It was So you can see I'm not, I mean, the EQ curve is actually pretty extreme, boosting up some of the highs, cutting out the mids, and then really scooping the lows. Um, but I think with that style of pitch correction, it seems to work pretty well with it. Okay, so that's a kind of an overview of the process. The next thing I want to look at are some of these panners, which may look pretty foreign to you. 
Um, and that's because they are, especially in this style of music, this isn't something we'd normally see. So what I'm doing is using the binaural panner, which you can get here. When you click on the stereo output, you can go to binaural pan. And this is using psychoacoustic principles, things like how sound when it is behind you, how it sounds differently, and how the time differences and delay differences between your ears, it, it plays into all of that. And it just moved. Um, let's put it back. So I have that keyboard part just in the back. You're only going to really hear the difference if you have headphones on. But I want to look at some of these other pieces here. Because I automated some movement into this. So it's not just staying in one spot. It's moving around in front of and sometimes behind the head. And it adds this sensation, I would say, more than anything. It doesn't really add something immediately noticeable. It almost sounds just like a little pan movement. But with headphones, it starts to move around your whole listening environment. And with headphones, I think that this is one of the secret sauces for the entire song. And I did that as well with the dobro. For the first part, at least. I didn't automate them to move, but the background vocals are also moved around the sphere so that not only are they coming uh, not from directly in the front, but I mean, they're off to the sides in the back, sometimes directly in the back, sometimes a little bit closer to the center. And so as these things are all playing, it has a lot more of a sensation of you being surrounded by them rather than uh, just all of them being on the stage in front of you. To the ones that can never, ever hear what you say. So you can hear a little bit all of these elements now, especially if you're on headphones, they build around the listener instead of just being in front of the listener. And for me, that's a huge benefit to having some of these tools in this workflow so that you can actually get a sensation of being involved with the music and having it do something a little bit different for you uh, than just maybe a normal stereo mix would do. Now, binaural techniques like that work even on streaming services. So you're going to, if you listen to this on the iTunes version or the Spotify version, you're still going to hear things move around you. Uh, just, I mean, it's very subtle. It's supposed to be subtle. I want it to be more of a sensation than this overt thing. But if you're listening in the car, it doesn't do as much. It hardly does anything at all. It still sounds like a good mix, but it doesn't have that motion that's as noticeable. But tons of people are listening on headphones, and that's the group. I wanted someone to hear this, maybe 
say I listen to it in the car and later on I put headphones on, it's like a whole different dimension. There's different layers to the production, and I think that that's really meaningful. For a long time, when I first started in music, I was working on other people's music mostly. That was so easy in some ways. They had a beginning, a middle, and end to a song. They had thought about all the lyrics and how this all ties out. They had had arrangements created, and it was my job as an engineer to really help just record it and make it sound good. When you actually do your own music, it's so easy to be like, you know what, I've got this great idea. It's a bar or four bars or eight bars long. And then that's as far as you go with it because how do you build out a song so that it has all of those different parts in motion to them? One of the main things you can do is learn about the song forms that people commonly use, and then you realize at least what you're shooting for. In this case, I'm using A, B, A, B, C, B, which is standard, I don't know, I've heard it called different things, but contemporary ballad format or just standard song format, classic song format. Um, And that's what I typically use. And we use that because we want to have the repetition of parts that the audience gets to know across the song. And so you're always returning kind of that, that re, you know, repeated lines or repeated melodies. And then you throw something in at the end to, so you don't get just bored out of their mind. But you have to find those elements which are going to be that golden brick of your song. And for me, in this particular song, the song is all fine. Uh, I like the motion in a lot of the parts. So there's always that little bit of motion that's happening, the motion. The other thing that would be a little unique would be the the use of the binaural techniques. And then the other thing I think that for me stands out would be just the layering of the vocals in a way. And if you listen to the whole song, you'll hear certain parts repeated at different times. And it it all ties in together in a way that if you're listening to it in that way, you're going to hear different things happening. And the more you listen to it, the more... Like you're understanding it. So I like that there is depth to it. Is this a complicated song? No. There's only really five different instruments and then vocals. I mean, this could be like a live production in some ways. There's, it's so simple in many ways. And so I don't think you have to make this complicated mix with gazillion tracks to make something that have depth to it and width to it. Uh, in most cases here, let's see, I, I'm i pretty sure I added the stereo spread to the bass. And then I did a correlation meter to make sure it wasn't phasing out. But some of these things, these two came with the drum preset. I added the step effects. I added the, the stereo spread. Um, these two came with the preset, and then all of these I just created once and then copied as I added new tracks. So not a ton of effects either. A lot of them are the built-in effects. Alchemy came with its own sound. And um, I'm using, let's see how many the reverbs are actually triggering. Far sounds to the ones that can never drum reverb I'm not even using. So just two different reverbs for the whole thing. I think it it comes up with a nice sound. The last thing I'll point out here is that I'm using match EQ and I pulled in a song off of uh, a U2 album, just pulled off a clip of it. I think it was All That You Can't Leave Behind and it may have been Elevation or something off the album. I can't remember right this second. But I use that as the uh, the reference, and I put it on here so that, because in all honesty, the final mix for this song was done on a pair of Apple earbuds. So um, that's not how I recommend mixing, nor is it how I typically mix, but I'm studying a lot because I'm a professor. I teach this. I'm doing an online class, or I just finished one. I'm doing another one this summer with students. And I've got to know how to make things sound decent when you're working with the lowest common denominator. And so I did the final parts of this mix on Apple earbuds. 
And I use this reference tool, the Match EQ, to take a, a fully finished song and match my frequency to it. And this is darn close. I mean, this is not bad uh, considering uh, how I'd mixed it. And the final thing, it added a little bit of bass down here. I cut a lot of bass out, typically just to be safe. And you can see a little bit, it had to boost up in the highs, but um, that's pretty high up there. So it's not neither here nor there for the most part. But not bad for the rest of it. So I used that. I used a reference track and then analyzed the current mix. And then I matched it using the EQ curve. And that worked out, I think, really well. It sounds good. I listened to it in all my normal places, the car, my nicer headphones, on the Apple ear, ear well, the earbuds, and um, shared it with people. No one would have guessed, I don't think, that uh, um, I did the final mix on Apple earbuds. So that's an excellent sign. And it shows it is possible to make something that's listenable. Could it have been better mixed in a million-dollar studio with big speakers? Probably. But that's not the reality we're in this month. And so I wanted to, uh, to start experimenting with and using techniques which can really boost up some of the the options we have currently. So that's a, a summary of all of this. For those of you who are still listening, uh, if you're interested in getting a download of this project, I would do everything except for the vocals. I'll do a, a stereo bounce of the vocals and put that just because... Um, I mean, there's a lot of work in there, and the the raw vocals, if you turn off flex pitch and auto tune, sound pretty much like you'd expect. So I would probably just do a sub mix. If anyone's interested in getting the mix, um, but having the vocals bounce down just to mess with the instruments and things and the patches, let me know. Um, I'll make a link available, but uh, you'll have to put that in the comments that you're interested in that. And then, um, but otherwise. Like I said, hope you enjoyed this and uh, we'll do some more songwriting discussions over the next few months. I think we're going to pick one day a week and just talk about songwriting. I've got some other tracks that I've finished and other ones I've worked on with other people. And I think that there's some actual specific steps you can take to become a better songwriter. Uh, but I don't think, for me, it's not possible to separate the songwriting with the production. And so doing a lot of the stuff here with effects, I build the song as I go. I don't actually write a song and then build it with all the production later. The two for me are intertwined. And I think that's the same for a lot of you who are listening to this, just based on my experience with how people are working these days. But there are some tricks with that. And there's definitely some parts that are hard with that. But I think it's really fulfilling in the end. Okay. Again, hope you enjoyed this, and I will talk to you tomorrow.